I had already unscrewed all the modules, but many of the power cables were still connected. As I take out each module, I'm using my electronics duster to shake loose some of the filth that has accumulated on the PCBs. Even if your case is very well sealed, dust will still make its way onto the circuit boards through the jacks and the small gaps between panels. Since I tend to use my big cases in an angled tabletop configuration, this problem is much more of an issue than if I kept my cases oriented vertically. Probably the most annoying thing about taking a modular case apart for modifications is where to put all the damn modules when they're not in the case. I did this on the floor to make filming easier, but I actually found this a bit more comfortable than attempting to do the same thing while constantly leaning over my desk. I bought three Intelligel TPS-80W power supplies in June 2018, shortly before I recorded the first video for this channel. So this case modification project has been in the works for a while. Mainly, I just didn't want to pull all my modules out, as I was actively using the case for some time. I decided to trade the Maleco powers out of one of my big cases for these Intelligel power boards, mainly because I want more available power. The Intelligel TPS-80W has significantly more power capacity on the positive 12 volt rail. I'll miss the shrouded headers on the Maleco powers, and they also have two more power headers per board than the Intelligel. The Intelligel has 20 connections, while the Maleco has 22. After installation, the Intelligel boards ended up being a bit lower profile inside the case, making it easier to fit some of my deeper modules pretty much wherever I want. The Intelligel boards are also much lighter, although once all the modules are in the case, the weight difference is negligible. Amusingly, while working on this video, I saw that Intelligel has released a new version of the TPS-80W that is a darker color and has shrouded headers. Not sure if they changed much else, but it doesn't seem like it. Now to take out the rails so I can get to the power boards more easily, but first I'm going to detach the power supply module. The Maleco powers use solderless connectors that are very secure, but can be a bit frustrating. Needle nose pliers are a big help. In a cruelly ironic twist, these are called Fast-On connectors. Now to unscrew some of the rails, which just attach directly to the side plates. My Rat Shack multimeter is simply being used to prop up the rails, so I can avoid having them fall onto the power boards. One thing I really like about the design of the Maleco powers is that there really isn't much to damage on the top side of the board other than the status LEDs. All of the other components are tucked on the underside, and the shrouded headers act as a protective barrier around the outside edges. However, this does come at the cost of a somewhat higher profile. I cobbled together the standoffs I used by combining some hex standoffs that were a bit too short with an additional screw and a nut to act as a spacer. An additional nut goes on top of the board to secure the boards to the standoffs, and I'm using a socket in my hand to help loosen the nuts. Each power board in this case is mounted with nine standoffs. The standoffs are attached to the inside of the case using an automotive epoxy. One of the reasons I chose to use epoxy instead of drilling the case was that I wasn't totally sure about the placement of the power boards and wanted to test out their positioning. When I built the case, I didn't have any plans to swap to a different power supply, but I did consider it as a possibility. The other reason I chose to use epoxy is partly aesthetics, but also while designing this case, I decided to make it so when it has the lid on, there are no open holes, ports, or jacks on any part of the outer surface. This is also the main reason I chose to use a power supply module instead of mounting the power supply jack directly to the side or back of the case. These globs of epoxy are certainly quite ugly, but when the case is all put together, no one can see them. Out of sight, out of mind. Although a single epoxied mount doesn't have the strength of a standoff attached by drilling through the case, even with just a few attachment points, the epoxied mounts are far stronger than necessary once the epoxy has fully cured. Having nine attachment points like this is perhaps a bit overbuilt. The Maleco and Intelligel boards are almost exactly the same width, but the Malecos need much higher standoffs. However, by temporarily leaving a couple of the standoffs in place, it will make it a bit easier to mark the mounting locations for the Intelligel boards. The placement of the power boards does not need to be particularly precise though, especially since I'm not drilling through the case. 
If I was drilling through the case, I would end up spending a huge amount of time to make sure the drill hole placement would be as aesthetically pleasing as possible. I wasn't sure what the best way to remove the epoxied standoffs would be. It's possible to soften this epoxy and reduce its adhesion with heat, which requires temperatures of up to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. I tried using a desoldering iron to warm up the epoxy blobs a bit, but it was pretty much a waste of time. The proper heating tool for this would have been a heat gun, but I don't own one, and I wasn't enamored with the idea of bringing any part of my case to those temperatures. Most likely, it would not have been an issue, but rapid expansion and contraction of a metal box constructed with very tight tolerances and two different alloys of aluminum is not a field test I am interested in conducting. With a pair of pliers and some angular force, the mounts popped off relatively easily, so heat was not necessary. Let's take a closer look at the composition of the standoffs. When I built the case, I already had some cheapo hex standoffs I ordered for another project a long time ago, but they were a bit too short. With an M3 screw and an M3 nut as a spacer, they are almost exactly the right height, with just enough thread left over on the male part of the spacer. My brother gave me this sweet tank top over the holidays. Now it's time to sand off some of that epoxy. I left the two middle mounts to make it easier to mark the mounting spots for the IntelliGel boards. Epoxy and aluminum dust are just about the last things you want to be inhaling, so I used a dust mask. I would also recommend to wear a hat to keep the dust out of your hair. Unfortunately, I tend to lack that level of foresight. To be honest, I'm pretty proud I at least remembered to wear a mask. The epoxy is relatively soft compared to the aluminum, so I just reused some old sanding pads. I didn't want to make a fresh sanding pad all dirty with epoxy dust, and I didn't want anything too rough that would chew on the aluminum. At this point in the project, I foolishly thought I might still be able to use the existing center mounts, so I wasted some time with the Dremel doing unnecessary detail work to remove the blob of epoxy between them. The most fun part of turning your living space into a workshop is constantly cleaning up after yourself. Sanding aluminum creates a lot of very fine dust, so I also made sure to thoroughly wipe the case down with a damp cloth. Now I'm ready to mark the approximate standoff locations for the IntelliGel boards. I'm going to use my metal scoring tool. This has been one of the most useful purchases I've ever made for doing metal work. A quick tap of the hammer and I get a nice mark in the aluminum. I decided to draw circles around the marks with a sharpie to make it easier to spot them later. With the marks in place, now it's time to remove the remaining standoffs and clean up the rest of the epoxy. I was in a hurry here, and by the time I realized I forgot my dust mask, I decided to just get it done. I sometimes have respiratory allergies, and I definitely felt the effects of even this relatively brief dust exposure. The TPS 80W documentation recommends to use 4mm PEX standoffs, but I don't want to buy a bunch of those if I don't have to. I'm going to use some flathead M3 machine screws that I wouldn't want to actually use as screws since they are flatheads and some fairly thick M3 plastic washers I bought a long time ago, somewhat by accident. The head of the screw, combined with the plastic washer, gives just the right amount of clearance. The part of the IntelliGel board that is closest to the mounting surface are the pins of the DC power input-output. I wasn't sure if I wanted to use one plastic washer or two just to make sure. But after some analysis, I found that with proper standoff placement, even significant pressure on the board would not flex it enough to cause those pins to come into contact with the mounting surface. So I decided to just use one washer and keep the boards as low profile in the case as possible. I'm out of epoxy, so now it's time for a trip to the hardware store for a fantastic opportunity to get some fresh city air and enjoy the beautiful Chicago weather. Check this crap out. That new building used to be an auto repair place. Right next to me is a community pool and park. Take a look at the buildings around here. Just another reason why I'm planning to move before my rent goes up again. It's already way too high as it is.
At least I can still depend on the crafty beaver. I don't want the JB quick weld. I want the normal stuff, even though it takes several hours to cure. The tensile strength of the quick weld is much lower, and the working time is very short. I'm using the plastic part of the packaging to mix up the epoxy. It's always a pain to get a nice one-to-one -one ratio of the epoxy mix. It's very thick and takes a long time to stop coming out of the tube after you stop squeezing. I'm using a popsicle stick to mix and apply the epoxy. Due to the curing time of the epoxy, it will take at least a couple days to finish mounting the standoffs. First, I'm attaching the four corner standoffs of each board with a minimum amount of epoxy. After curing for four to six hours, I'll verify that they are in the proper locations before I epoxy additional standoffs. It's fairly easy for them to slide a bit out of position or end up at a slight angle and need adjustment. Since they've only had the minimum curing time, it's pretty easy to pop them off and re-epoxy. The additional epoxy on the bottom from the first attempt just makes them more stable and easier to place in the correct spot. I didn't mix up quite enough of this first batch of epoxy in order to do all four corners of all three boards. This epoxy has had some time to cure, so now it's time to check to see how accurate I was with these placements. I'm trying to move as few of the mounts as possible, so I take my time figuring out which ones are in a good spot and which ones need adjustment. I don't need the pliers to pop them off at this point, but removal still requires a decent amount of force. I'm using a utility razor blade to remove the remaining epoxy. This epoxy process is rather error prone, but the minor mistakes are easily fixed and I can continue to make progress. Now to mix up another batch of epoxy and fix these corner standoffs. Once I have verified the mounting position of a standoff, I add additional epoxy around the base. The best tool I have found for this is a dental pick. I have several I bought in a pack from a computer store years ago, and they are very useful for all sorts of things. Increasing the surface area of the epoxy in contact with the standoff and the case greatly increases the attachment strength. Drilling the case would overall be much faster and less work, but I'm willing to spend the time on the epoxy since this is a personal build and I'm more concerned with satisfying my design goals rather than attempting to manufacture it as efficiently as possible. For peace of mind, I decided to change the mounting placements slightly from what I had originally marked in order to make sure that the power boards are unable to flex at the point where they are closest to the surface of the case. It's epoxy time again. Now I'm attaching the remaining mounts and verifying their placement as I go. With the four corners of each board securely in place, it's much easier to check the placement of the freshly epoxied standoffs without bumping them out of position. I'm using the remaining epoxy in this batch to beef up the mounting points I've already made sure are correct. I'm making sure to thoroughly wipe the remaining epoxy off the dental pick. It would be very frustrating to have to remove it after it is cured, and I don't want to ruin any tools if I can avoid it. I finally have all the mounts in place, so I'm testing the fit after they have all finished curing. All the standoffs appear to be properly positioned, so now for the last round of reinforcement epoxy. It's time to do the wiring. I'm using 18 gauge dual stranded core, and I have the recommended spade connectors. I'll just take the fast on connectors off the power input panel and replace them with the spade connectors. The IntelliGel boards are meant to have the power connections routed underneath in order to provide some strain relief. I'm leaving some slack when cutting these daisy chain connectors to length. This will all be hidden inside, so it doesn't need to be perfect and exact, and a bit of slack makes it easier to put together. My buddy John gave me these sweet cable cutters many years ago, so I have to give him a shout out. It'd be pretty easy to take someone's finger off with these bad boys. They're just the right size for it, too. I do have a proper wire stripper, but it's the kind you have to adjust for different thicknesses, so I only use it in certain situations. I got the soldering iron out, 
because I found these spade connectors to be pretty annoying. I was hoping to just crimp the spade connectors onto the stranded wire, but it is a very weak attachment, so I also ended up soldering them to strengthen the mechanical connection. Taking proper care of these kinds of small details can add up to a lot of time when building a case. Now that the power connections are in place, I'm attaching the nuts that hold the boards down. This particular mounting screw gave me some trouble until I realized it had gotten a bit of epoxy on the threads. It's very important to be extra careful with your epoxy application. The epoxy was annoying to remove, but fortunately not really an issue. Let's do a quick power LED test. I already have the power connector snaked up from the underside of my desk. Looking pretty good. For a power brick, I'm using a MeanWell GSM-160A15R7B. The daisy-chained IntelliGel boards can draw far more power than this brick can supply, but the total power consumption of a typical configuration for this case is less than 6 amps, and the brick is rated to supply up to 9.6 amps. The main reason I wanted more power in this case is to compensate for the additional inrush current needs of a few Metasonics modules. From a convenience standpoint, this also gives me more flexibility and less headaches as I'm less likely to run into the limit of a single power board when doing a module configuration where a bunch of power hungry modules all end up getting plugged into a single power board. Even before I had any Metasonics modules to worry about, with the lower capacity of the Maleco powers, there were some situations where I had to adjust how the modules were connected to the boards. Additionally, I really don't like running a switching power supply above 70 to 80 percent capacity. I got a bit ahead of myself and put all the rails back in before properly testing, but it worked out. For the first power test, I got out my Rat Shack multimeter and verified that I was getting the proper voltage coming through on the rails of each power board. To do this, I use a ribbon cable connected to the power supply and a couple of alligator clips holding component leads so I can stick them into the different parts of the ribbon cable. I'm using a 16 pin to 10 pin ribbon cable and flipping around the 16 pin connector will give me access to the 5 volt rail. Everything seems to be looking good, with excellent tolerances on the power rails of each board. Now it's time for spectrum analysis. I'm going to be looking for any noise coming off the power rails that might be in the audible spectrum. Since I don't have a proper oscilloscope, I have a cable running into my Expert Sleepers ES6 to get the signal from the power rails into my computer without any DC filter, and I'm just using Ableton to check the spectrum. Seeing noise on the rails isn't the end of the world, as some modules are better at rejecting or filtering power supply noise than others, but if it isn't there in the first place, there's a lot less to worry about. Looks like excellent performance on all the rails, and all of the noise in the audible range is below negative 110 dBFS, with much of it even quieter. Personally, I find that when testing a hardware setup, a noise floor of around negative 90 dBFS is very good. Now to get all these modules off my other table. Not going to plug them in, just want them off the table. I'm going to have to meditate for a while on a new module configuration. I originally got an Octatrack to use with my modules, but pairing the Octatrack with one of my big cases seems overwhelming to me now that I have so much more knowledge and experience with the Octatrack. So now I'm giving first dibs on module selection to my small case to configure it for use with an Octatrack. The focus of this setup is the Octatrack, with the modules providing a handful of flexible sound sources controlled by MIDI. I've considered setting up a big case to be paired with a machine drum, but that feels a bit overwhelming also. Lately, I'm thinking to try making a stand for my big cases so they can be used together as a single unit, with no electrons involved. For myself, I find that combining an electron with a big modular takes up a lot of mental overhead. But combining two big cases of modules and keeping my focus limited to the modular mindset is much more manageable and enjoyable. <laughs> 